All right, Chief, tell me, 50 years of it. When did this start out, and what started it out? Well, I guess it started back, uh, of course, when I was a teenager. I uh, was leaving, fixed to graduate high school, and I was trying to decide to go into the military or into law enforcement. I knew I wanted to serve. I didn't know for sure exactly whether I wanted to serve the military or, or, or what. I was talking to a good friend of mine, J.R. Jones, who was a sheriff's deputy out of Harris County. And uh, J.R. told me that, uh, hey, you know, he says, y'all be a cop. And I said, well, well, what, you know, what would I do or be able to do doing that? He said, man, you can do everything you can in the military. You just do it here at the house. You can stay close to home, you know, be close to your wife, your family. And I said, I'm not even married at the time. And, he said, well, you will be someday, but he said, it's nice to serve the people that, that at, at, at where you live, you know, it gives more rewarding experience. And I thought, you yeah, know, that makes sense, you know, and so that led me to the, the career of uh, getting in Texas A&M's class number one of uh, basic peace officer certification. And uh, back in those days, I had to work during the daytime, go to school at nighttime to complete the course. and. Uh, uh, back in those days, it was 240 hours was your basic peace officer certification course and uh, completed that and uh, working for Walter Rankin's office, who was a constable precinct one in Harris County at the time, and then uh, left Walter's office when the constables first got patrol uh, because I really wanted to, to, to be out in, in, in the field and, and serve the public personally. And uh, so I got one of the very first constable patrol units, 7313 out of Baytown, and uh, my district was Highlands Crosby Barrett Station, and uh, worked that a very large area at the time, and uh, worked it pretty much by myself. There was one trooper on until about 11 o'clock in the evening, and he went home, and uh, one at Sheriff's Department unit, and we were backing each other up, and it just wasn't a whole lot of protection like there is nowadays. It was it was it was tough back in those days. Baseball bats and record drivers. Baseball and the record drivers. That's what we depended on heavily, you know. And they saved her bacon a many a time out there. What uh, from there? Where'd you go from? From there, I went to uh, uh, Precinct Five Constable's office. Uh, they were the, the new constable at that time was uh, just started up a motorcycle division, and uh, was looking for officers for it. And I thought, man, I'd really like to be a motorcycle officer. I thought that anyway at the time, so I bought one of those Kawasaki KZ-1000s and me and a friend of mine that was both at Precinct 3 left and went to Precinct 5 as motorcycle officers. And uh, But I didn't realize in Texas it's either sometimes too hot or too cold or it's raining, so you had to know where all the underpasses were to get to them, you know, when, when the rains would hit. And it was, uh, it was pretty rough. Uh, doing motor patrol, so I respect those guys a lot, but I enjoyed it a lot and uh, uh, did that up until the time that uh, I saw that Splendor had advertised for police chief. And I thought, man, I had a lot of schools. I went, spent a lot of time going through schools at the Harris County Sheriff's Department at the time. And I thought, you know, well, put me a little resume together and submit it and see, take my chances. And I didn't much figure I had a chance at it, honestly, but. Uh, I put in for it, and sure enough, they called me up for an interview, and uh, ended up, uh, Don Ipes was the mayor at that time, they ended up hiring me as their police chief to build the police department, and so I went from a sergeant at Precinct 5 to a uh, uh, chief of police, and I think at the time I was the youngest police chief in Texas, and uh, but uh, started building this department, and uh, growing with the city of Splendora, and uh, grew the department, and. Uh, was able to get some manpower grants through HGAC and uh, build the staff, serve the citizens and stuff like that. And, what uh, year was that? Oh boy, give me the line to you. I want to say around 80, somewhere around in that area. And um, stayed stayed there. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's going to be probably around the 77, 78 era. And then uh, because in 82, is when I went through the FBI National Academy and up in Quantico. And I went through the 128th session at FBI National Academy, which was always a dream of mine. I waited like three years uh, from the time I put my application to the time I was finally accepted after they'd gone through the interview process and background investigation and stuff like that. So went to Quantico, spent three months there, came back and uh, realized I was kind of getting up there in the years and, uh, you know, need to start thinking about a retirement and benefits and stuff like that. So I tried to talk the city into 
you know, getting a retirement program and getting some insurance because at that time we didn't have retirement. We didn't have, they didn't hold out social security. We just didn't have any benefits at all. And um, a lot of the, the, the city staff just felt it wasn't that time. And so sadly, I, I told them, I said, look, I'm not getting any younger. And if I don't get with a bigger agency, I'm afraid, you know, I'm, I'm, life's gonna pass me by. So I ended up going to work for Harris County Sheriff's Department and uh, worked at the rehab. And back in those days, you had to go straight to the jail, you know, no matter how much training you had. So that was what we called, to, called in those days the rehab ranger. And uh, went out there, worked uh, over a year out there. A new mayor took office down here, uh, Jack Lucas, and, and Jack started calling me out there to rehab and want me to come back, want me to come back. And after over a year with the sheriff's department, at that time, Jack Hurd was kind of having a battle between Commissioner's Court and the Sheriff's Department and all the constables were getting all the patrol slots. So it was beginning to look like I was going to finish my years in the jail. So uh, uh, go, so staying there, working every day, going to jail just didn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And uh, so Jack Lucas called one night and said, hey, I, I really want you back as chief. So uh, I took a friend of mine that was working at the Sheriff's Department at that time. We were both tired working in the jail, so we came back. So I worked for Splendor probably another five years and again faced the same problem that I faced the first time. I couldn't get them to put any benefits in place, no retirement, no insurance, no social security, no anything. So I left a second time and went to Harris County in a constable's office, this time Precinct 4, and stayed there until uh, I, I spent 27, 28 years there. and. Uh, Worked my way up from the bottom of the ladder all the way up to assistant chief. And then the day I retired, uh, the constable pulled me to chief deputy. And, uh, uh, you know, really enjoyed the people I worked with down there. But it was, you know, I was ready for, I had started a gun range. I thought, was really in the process of winding my career down. I'd got my retirement, got my benefits and stuff like that. So I bought a gun range up here in Cleveland and we built a gun range. And I was going to do that. And that's when... Uh, the mayor at, at uh, the city of Swindor started, I started getting calls and uh, after probably about three or four weeks I started having, every time I seen a cop car running up down the road running hot I'd get withdrawals so I still had enough, uh, I guess, testosterone in me I wanted to keep working and uh, so uh, eventually they talked me into coming back and I did and it's been a very rewarding experience here working with the mayor and the council and rebuilding the police department and making it into what it is today and extremely proud of the police department here and the men and women that I have working for me and they're they're what's make me shine you know and then they do it very well they're, they're a super bunch of officers and uh, the training I, I'm a firm believer in training and management and enhancing the abilities of the officers and drones technology and stuff like that um, I've got just great guys that are just doing great things for me <clears throat> Worked in Harris County rehab. I mean, there's a whole different ball game there. Oh yeah. No air conditioning. Yeah. Like, Working the fields. Yeah, that's, 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 that's it. That's it. I mean, I felt like I was in jail for 12 months. Actually, well, actually, I was in jail 12 months. But uh, what year was that? That's your... that an 82. Okay. Uh, right after I got out of the National Academy, I, I approached the city for benefit package again. They, they basically wasn't ready for it. And I, I'd had the National Academy now, and I felt like I was ready to further my career with a big agency, and that's why I went down there. So. What about Precinct Four? What area did you work in? I, I worked uh, Humble for uh, probably three quarters of my career. For a short time, I went to Cypress Wood uh, as a patrol lieutenant on night shift. Uh, I had a position come open, and to, uh, the, very tough to to get promoted in a department that size with 600 plus officer so but I took the lieutenant job because it was what I had to do to get start going up the ladder and uh, so I did and worked out of central for till a patrol opening patrol lieutenant's opening came up in, in Humble and I transferred back because it's closer to my house in Humble and an assistant chief there uh, Larry Shifflett at the time was a uh, very sharp guy very intelligent guy I learned a lot from him and uh, Ended up working my way to captain there under his administration as uh, uh, chief deputy. And then uh, when Chief Shifflett retired, uh, uh, Constable promoted me to, uh, Constable Herman promoted me at that time to uh, assistant chief and ultimately chief deputy on my retirement date. So I uh, spent my tenure out there in Humble. 
I, lo- I like Humble. It's close to home. I know the okay, people so out there. Some of the changes in law enforcement back 30, 40, year, 50 years ago compared to now. What's the biggest change you've seen? Night and day. Uh, the biggest difference, uh, I think, is and really kind of uh, discouraging, you know, is what law enforcement has to go through now uh, versus the old days. I, I, I would refer them back to them. Uh, you know, you get out there and you got some guy that jumps bad on one of the officers out there and the officer ends up getting in the fight. Seems like in the old days we had citizens stopping helping us, you know, uh, to subdue the subject. And now you got people driving by with their cameras going, you know, just, just looking for, I guess, that million dollar footage, you know. And then sadly, the footage that they put on TV is about a 15, 20 second clip of what actually happened there. And they leave off the part that got the officer to the point that, you know, you have to use what force is necessary to affect the arrest. And that never looks gentle, you know, when you have to use force to arrest somebody and they don't want to be arrested. And they don't see the first part, which is where the, the guy takes a swing at the officer or the guy goes for a gun or the guy's cursing the officer out, causing his mother all kinds of language. And, and it's just horrible what they, what, how the lack of respect has, has transpired over the years, you know, and uh, it, it's terrible. The kids don't seem to respect their parents, don't seem to rec- respect the law enforcement. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we need to get back to the, the, the Ten Commandments and, and church and school and, and teaching godly ways and, you know, we've lost our way in that. And I, I think uh, not everybody, you know, and, and uh, the one thing I like about out here serving the people out here is there's some good people out here, good folks. And, and more than once I've had people stop and help us out here. You know, that's the Harris County is a little bit different uh, than Montgomery County. And uh, we've got a great district attorney here that, that's pro law enforcement, pro punishing the criminal. And that, that is a big difference. Uh, Think the world of Brett Legion. He's he's just doing us a great job as a district attorney, and uh, so it's uh we're moving in the right direction down here. I feel, and it's getting better. Back then, it's uh, now it's bringing a gunfight to or bringing a gun to a gunfight. Used to be bringing knives to gunfights. Yeah, you didn't, you yeah. Didn't have I, the shape. You had more a lot of standing, very few shapes. Oh yeah, I mean we're seeing so 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 many weapons right now. In the old days, we very seldom found a gun in a car or had to deal with somebody. If they did, it was a robbery or burglar or something like that arm, but now everybody's got a gun. And, you know, sadly, since they've changed up some of the laws, they're not getting the training that they should be getting. I hated to see the fact that that they stop mandating training. And I think it should, people should know the responsibility that goes with the weapon. You know, and I'm certainly not against uh, civilians carrying weapons because nowadays I, I, I I don't go anywhere without mine and uh, because I never know what I'm gonna walk into the middle of and our, uh, what somebody I'm going to need to use my law enforcement powers to affect arrest to save somebody, you know. I mean, you can't even go to church and be safe anymore. I mean, we certainly are aware of the, the old scene shooting. So it's just things, times have changed. Respect for law enforcement has changed, and uh, it's a dangerous job out there. Communications, radios. Big difference compared then to now. Yeah, big difference. I mean, in the old days, we had the old low band radios, 37100, 180, 260. Uh, still remember the frequency numbers, you know. And you'd, key, you'd key up the radio, and then you'd sit there and you'd hear that dyna motor spin up in the trunk. That, that You waited for a few seconds to get sped up so you get the maximum wattage. And you may make it to dispatch. You may not make it to dispatch. You know, it just never. You, know, you may be talking to somebody in California because the skip would be in. It'd be like a hopped up CB radio. So yeah, it's, it's changed a bunch now. And now we got uh, automated radios that send identifiers and with officer down buttons. You know, it's, it's, it's progressed in, in a positive aspect in that area. So that's good. You know, we got far better communication. I mean, it could always be improved, but far better than today than what it what it was and when I first got into it. I mean, we, we didn't have handheld walkie talkies back in those days. And when we did get them, they were like big old bricks and with a, uh, foot and a half antenna on them, you know, so it was, and they still didn't get out very far. Prior, prior weapon back then was a shotgun compared to long gun now. Yeah, it was uh, back in the old days, we had shotguns, I remember with all of assault rifles, uh, and uh, revolvers was the, the gun of choice. And now, you know, there's still a few revolvers out there, but they're few and far in between. Most everybody's gone to high capacity automatics now because it's what the bad guys have, you know. When you get in a gunfight, you got to be able to sustain yourself until your backup gets there, and 
you don't want to be shooting your six rounds and then reaching for a speed loader or something like that. And of course, that, I can remember the days when we wear uh, our, our belt rigs, we wore our bullets and bullet loops on the front. You know, you had to pull them out one at a time, you know, and then they developed, came out with speed loaders. We thought that was the greatest thing since balloon tires. You know, you could take and just pop one into your deal and twist it and six rounds are ready to go. So, but now you got the automatics carrying 21, 22 rounds with the magazine. You just push a button and throw another one in. So, big difference, big difference. Most terrible scene that you've had over all the years? Oh, uh, I've had some horrendous scenes. There's a bunch of them. Uh, probably the Wyman Gorman plant explosion off 290. Uh, when that uh, went up, I was one of the first officers there. And uh, the carnage was pretty significant. Uh, there was body parts scattered all over the parking lot. And uh, it was uh, really a mess. It was, they were dealing with a pressurized tank that was supposed to not be under pressure. And all the service guys and I, I I don't remember how many there were, seven, eight, nine. Uh, but when that tank lid blew off, it just uh, it, it devastated those those people. They never knew what hit them. And uh, so I was one of the first officers on that scene, helped secure it and help, you know, mark body parts. And uh, so that was pretty pretty horrible. That sticks out in my mind. What about the most comical over all the years of all the scenes? Uh, <laughs> Uh, comical would be we. I got dispatched to a uh, possible homicide uh, right there off 1960, a body laying in the grass. So we all got there, and I was well, the first unit pulled up there. So I'm checking the area to make sure I still have an active shooter. I could see the body, and uh, so I started advancing on the body at the same time, watching my areas in case I still got an active shooter somewhere. And I get up there, I go to check the see if there's any life left in the body, put my hand on a carotid artery, and uh, realize that I'm putting my hand on a plastic mannequin, and it was dressed up just exactly, it looked like a human body, you know, up to the time I touched it, you know. And uh, so we, uh, I called dispatch, let them know what I had, so they wouldn't, they had a bunch of units running hot there, so we picked that mannequin up, and uh, as I have to say, that mannequin, been long enough ago I could talk about it now, but that mannequin made his round through the department and back seats, patrol cars and trunks. When you lift the trunk up, the, the mannequin would come up and I had one guy almost shoot his trunk in the patrol car. So uh, we had a lot of fun with that mannequin, but <laughs> that's probably most, one of the most hilarious deals that we had was that, you know. How much longer are you gonna keep going with this? Well, the Lord keeps blessing me and my, my health stays good and I'm working for a great city great mayor, great council, uh, great officers. I mean, I get up every morning and want to come to work. You know, I come in on weekends. I come out at week nights in the middle of the night. You know, I mean, I'm, I guess my day and nights are still screwed up from 50 years in this business and work a night shift most of my career. And I enjoyed night shift because it was more uh, personal. It was easier to get around, you know, to the hot calls and the stuff, the, the main calls that you would work at night shift were the shootings, uh, the, uh, the adrenaline, if you would, type calls, and the day shift seemed like we were mostly responding to take burglary reports and theft reports, and uh, we did get, you know, not saying totally day shift, totally boring, but night shift was was exciting. Anything else you can think of? No. That's it. <laughs>